Hey everyone, thanks for your time. The two big audits published recently for the Artemis programs were reminders that NASA and its Artemis contractors have room for improvement. But two things can be true at the same time. While there's room for improvement, progress continues towards upcoming Artemis missions. In this video, I'll go over some of the SLS puzzle pieces for Artemis 2 that we are seeing move into place, how that also relates to Artemis 3 and 4, and plans for a 2025 lunar landing test flight from the more publicly shy HLS provider that will support Artemis 5. Exploration Ground Systems completed the breadth of exercises in one of the integrated systems verification and validation tests planned ahead of Artemis 2. I went over the ISVV-1 test at a high level in the last video. Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs wrote on August 14th that the multi-day testing of emergency egress procedures was completed, while also providing more imagery of some of that testing out at Launch Pad 39B. The blog piece, the still images, and the B-roll video showed more parts of daytime and nighttime practice runs using the emergency egress system that is currently installed between the mobile launcher and the pad terminus area on the perimeter of the 39B infield. Baskets will be staged up on the 274 foot level of the ML to provide an escape route away from the top of the ML's umbilical tower and any emergency situation that might be declared. The launch team, pad personnel, and astronauts practiced everything except riding the baskets from the top of the mobile launcher down to the terminus area. Pad rescue teams also practiced emergency rescue procedures for different scenarios on the umbilical tower next to the vehicle and in the terminus area. In this edited video, we can see test runs with launch team personnel and with launch team crews suited as they would be on launch day. Here we see a few different views of the practice of a team getting out of the baskets together and moving into the mine resistant ambush protected vehicles or MRAPs. Those vehicles will be positioned there to continue the evacuation to a safer location for possible medical attention and assistance in one of these hypothetical emergency situations. In another part of the test, personnel representing the flight crew and pad teams practiced an emergency evacuation of Orion with the FireX system activated and showering the escape route, as might be the case in an emergency situation. On launch day, there could be three teams on the mobile launcher, the flight crew and the closeout crew who are working to get the astronauts situated in Orion for launch, and possibly a red crew to deal with any issues that require hands-on troubleshooting or other actions at the launch pad. Besides those crews, the pad rescue teams are positioned the next closest to the vehicle on launch day and are available to provide assistance in an emergency evacuation. Everyone would need to be able to find their way to the escape baskets and get in under low visibility conditions. Still images of a nighttime practice run were also posted. ISVV-1 is complete now and all the notes and feedback will be incorporated into any revision of procedures and a future training exercise that is expected with the Artemis II flight crew. As a reminder, Artemis II is the first crewed launch of a NASA spacecraft and launch vehicle since the space shuttle was retired from flights in 2011. Taxi flights from Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center to the International Space Station now use commercially developed and operated spacecraft and transportation systems. Maybe it wasn't a top watch item, 
but one of the SLS puzzle pieces seems to be in place now with the announcement that the launch vehicle stage adapter for Artemis II will be rolled out of storage at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville on August 21st and will be subsequently loaded on the agency's Pegasus barge for a trip to KSC. After it was announced in mid-June that the Artemis II core stage would ride on Pegasus from the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans to the KSE launch site, that was also a signal that the barge was again available to make hardware deliveries. Core stage 2 was the highest priority, but there were three other pieces of SLS hardware for Artemis II, 3, and 4 that we've been aware of that needed transportation on Pegasus to KSC. Prior to the official delay of Artemis 2 and 3 announced in January, the boat tail for the Core Stage 3 engine section and the engine section itself for Core Stage 4 had been scheduled by NASA and Boeing to be delivered to KSC earlier this year. And the long since completed LVSA for Artemis 2 was the other piece that we've known about for a while. With Pegasus again available, it seemed like there was enough deck space on the barge to fit all three of those, but given how the media events last month were rescheduled or constrained, the opportunity to ask whether that was going to happen never materialized. With the media advisory about the LVSA rollout released on August 14th, SLS Public Affairs confirmed that triple shipment is the plan. Pegasus will pick up the Artemis II LVSA at Marshall and then be towed down the Mississippi River back to MAF, where the Core Stage 3 boat tail and the Core Stage 4 engine section will be loaded on board. Then Pegasus will make another trip from there to KSC. Although it's more difficult to get NASA to talk about planning and scheduling for upcoming Artemis missions, there are some takeaways from this planned SLS triple delivery. For Artemis II, shipping the LVSA is a sign that stacking SLS for the mission is getting closer. With the LVSA in place, likely stored in High Bay 4 of the Vehicle Assembly Building for the next few months, that will allow EGS Integrated Operations to proceed through the bolting of the SLS elements and get into integrated test and checkout of the launch vehicle with the mobile launcher and ground-based launch processing system. The boosters, core stage, LVSA, and interim cryogenic propulsion stage, or ICPS, will all need to be stacked together, and then all the ML umbilicals will need to be connected to power up the launch vehicle, perform those integrated checkouts, and get ready to roll out to Pad 39B, possibly as soon as next spring for a tanking test. Once LVSA is at Kennedy Space Center, all four of those launch vehicle elements will either be in the Vehicle Assembly Building, a couple of blocks away, or at the nearby Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. For Artemis 3, Boeing may be reaching the point in engine section integration where they really need to stack the core stage 3 engine section with the boat tail. And with the core stage 4 engine section, Boeing would have two units in an outfitting slash integration flow in the space systems processing facility at KSC. It's about a year later than forecast when the core stage 3 engine section was shipped from MAF to KSC in December 2022. At that time, Boeing forecasted the delivery of the Core Stage 4 unit in the middle of 2023. Once the engine section hardware arrives in the SSPF, it will of course be interesting to see when those two units are completed. The deliveries of the structures ended up almost two years apart, so it will be interesting to see what the spread is for their delivery when fully outfitted to the Vehicle Assembly Building. We still haven't seen a full shot of the Core Stage 3 engine section in the SSPF since this one was taken in June of 2023. And now, as we get to the end of the third quarter of 2024, that unit has been at Kennedy Space Center for almost two years. There's some news about Artemis 5, which is planned for early in the next decade now. If you're familiar with the commercial lunar landing services that NASA is now contracting, a team led by Blue Origin was selected by NASA in May of 2023 to be a second crew-rated lunar landing service provider. In a story for Space News published on August 12th, Jeff Faust noted in his story that Blue Origin has recently filed documentation that outlines their first planned lunar lander test flight. 
That documentation says the uncrewed test flight of a Mark I Blue Moon lander would take place no earlier than the first quarter of 2025, which is about half a year away. The lander will fly on Blue Origin's new Glenn launch vehicle, which is still being prepared for its first launch campaign. The documentation was filed with the Federal Communications Commission about, naturally, how communications will be conducted during the test flight. More interesting is the high-level summary of the test flight itself, since Blue Origin is notoriously secret about their work. The documentation provides the only details published so far about the flight plan for the test. When the Mark I lander launches on New Glenn, it will be inserted into low Earth orbit. After a few revolutions in LEO, the spacecraft would perform a first major burn to raise its apogee, which would also result in a longer orbital period. At the end of a revolution in that Earth elliptical orbit, the spacecraft would perform a translunar injection burn. After a transit of about a week, it would then perform a lunar orbit insertion burn. Plans call for the spacecraft to stay in lunar orbit for less than 10 hours. As we can see in the diagram, it would proceed into another series of burns over a few lunar orbits to lower it, and then finally a descent burn from low lunar orbit to the surface of the moon. From a big picture perspective, a couple of things to note are first that this flight plan does not include any other spacecraft or any propellant transfer. The blue moon architecture will eventually require those, and because it is based on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, active cryogenic fluid management technology is one of the technology watch items. It's not clear if this first test flight will incorporate active CFM to minimize hydrogen boil off, or whether passive measures will be enough to maintain the propellant for the approximately week-long period of time between launch and landing on the moon. The other significant piece of the architecture is the cislunar transporter, which is being developed by Lockheed Martin. Very little is known about this other secret spacecraft. A couple of generations of a render of it are pretty much all that has been published so far. The first generation Blue Moon architecture lost out to SpaceX's Starship system in 2021 in the Next Step Appendix H solicitation. This revision of the architecture, which won the Appendix P solicitation last year, also uses on-orbit propellant storage and transfer as Starship does, but it is based on liquid hydrogen fuel rather than liquid methane. For what it's worth, if Blue Origin were able to soft land this first generation spacecraft on the moon by next spring, it's possible that they will not only land on the moon before SpaceX's Starship HLS prototype does, but they would probably also be the first HLS spacecraft prototype to even reach a lunar distance from Earth. Having said that, it remains to be seen when the first fully outfitted New Glenn vehicle will roll to the pad, when it will finally lift off for the first time, and what the outcome of the test flight will be. Presumably, New Glenn will need to demonstrate a successful launch before this Mark I lunar lander test flight. However, it's also possible that the Mark I flight is already scheduled for the second New Glenn launch. Starship is the lunar lander that will take astronauts from the Gateway orbit to the lunar surface on Artemis 3 and 4, before Blue Moon would do the same on Artemis 5. In other news and notes from the week, the Human Exploration and Operations Committee of the NASA Advisory Council is having another meeting on August 29th as announced in the Federal Register on Monday, August 12th. That will be another opportunity to hear from NASA Exploration Directorate leadership, and we'll hope there are some new details about preparations for Artemis II and planning for Artemis III and beyond. Looking ahead to that update, here's the current outlook for Artemis II and III. For Artemis II, with the LVSA shipment now scheduled, as I said earlier, the elements of the SLS launch vehicle would all be, essentially, ready for stacking next month in September. SLS is responsible for the Orion stage adapter, which connects Orion to the launch vehicle, but the OSA is not needed for the SLS-only vehicle configuration that NASA is considering for a tanking test. The ICPS short stack would consist of the SLS boosters, core stage, LVSA, and ICPS, as I said earlier, 
And by the time that the Moon to Mars Program Office checkpoint is planned for the middle of September, all that hardware would be waiting for the call to begin assembly on the mobile launcher in the VAB. The wild card for Artemis II remains Orion. We're waiting for updates on the heat shield investigation and the status of spacecraft assembly and test. As a part of fully resolving the issues that we first heard about in January with the digital motor controller circuit and spacecraft batteries, some amount of quote-unquote penalty testing was expected to be necessary. Following the vacuum testing of the spacecraft in July, that might be what prime contractor Lockheed Martin is working on before beginning final installs and final closeouts ahead of handover to EGS. This upcoming NASA Advisory Council meeting is one opportunity to get an update in a couple of weeks, and the stacking checkpoint meeting would be another, assuming it is held around a month from now. For Artemis 3, the current outlook is mostly questions. When will the SLS and Orion flight hardware be ready to stack? When will Starship start the on-orbit testing needed? And will we see the mission planning milestones one would expect at this point? In theory, we would see precursor test flights ahead of the Artemis 3 flight hardware deliveries. Artemis 2 will be a major test flight, and it may be the next major one for Artemis as a whole. The Artemis 3 launch date is basically two years away, and there's a good deal of uncertainty about the Starship flight test schedule between now and then. The pivotal Starship demonstration flight test on the Artemis 3 schedule is the ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer demo which is scheduled for some time next year. If that prop transfer demo can be completed before Artemis II or in the same time frame, NASA should be pretty happy and the current September 2026 launch date for Artemis III probably remains on the table. If either or both of those test flights are delayed until closer to the end of 2025 or later, then Artemis III is likely looking at an official delay towards the end of 2026 into 2027 or later. Right now, it's unclear how many more Starship flight tests are needed before that key prop transfer demo test for Artemis III. The schedule for the next Starship flight test, the fifth one, is also unclear. Similarly, we haven't got an update on development of the Axiom extravehicular spacesuits that will be used by the Artemis III astronauts on the moon, so the NASA Advisory Council meeting in a couple of weeks is the next best opportunity for that. This upcoming SLS triple shipment of hardware for Artemis II, III, and IV, and the recent tour of the Michoud Assembly Facility provided a welcome peek at production of some Artemis III hardware. And the most recent update was that the Orion European Service Module for Artemis 3 was getting close to a KSC delivery. So we'll see if the SLS and Orion elements can stay within shouting distance of the contractual need dates, whatever those are. Maybe we'll get an update on those target dates in the upcoming meeting. Maybe. Looking at the current Artemis 3 target date of September 2026, which is for the Orion SLS launch, that would be the final one in the overall sequence, we've now pretty much covered the length of the delay announced in January, when the date was moved from the end of 2025 to September 2026. So we're now two years away, and as I've noted before, we would expect to start to see major planning milestones in the next six months or so. The most prominent would be announcement of a flight crew. Considering how much more complicated Artemis 3 will be than Artemis 2, and considering how much less time is in the NASA plan between those flights, on that timeline, I would expect to see the Artemis 3 flight crew announced next year, well before Artemis 2 launches. The mission integration review is generically targeted for L-18 months, and that's when the Artemis 2 flight crew began training for their mission. L-18 months would be in March. If the Artemis 3 crew is named in that time frame, it will be a sign that NASA intends to hold that September 2026 date. If not, that would probably also be a sign. Similarly, for the mission integration review, we would expect to see that sometime in the spring of next year, which isn't that far away. Thanks as always for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative.